Thank you. Uh, Thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, today I will present uh, Mendel uh, to you. Uh, but before we start, I just want to have a. It's always hard when we have a mixed group of people uh, to get an understanding of uh, your background a bit. So, how many work with embedded Linux on a daily basis? How many are familiar with the Yocto or Bill Group? Or familiar is enough, yeah. <laughs> uh, and how many have uh, done um, custom software update solutions on the better Linux? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, Mender is an op open source project to do uh, over there software updates for embedded Linux devices. Uh, a quick uh, session overview. Uh, we will start with some background uh, problems doing uh, software updates in, on embedded Linux and uh, challenges. Uh, and then we will dive into uh, how Mender tries to solve these problems. Uh, I'll try, I'm going to try to mix uh, <coughs> demo and slides. So it's not, I have a lot of slides. So I'll try to mix it a bit with the demonstration and explain what I'm doing. So, quickly about me, uh, Mirza. Uh, working the last seven years, or my full working experience in this field within a better Linux. Uh, started out more on the low level uh, Linux kernel browsers. Last few years, it's mainly been Yocto. Some bit of um, and I was actually Mender. Uh, I've been working on Mender since uh, the summer. But before that, I was an active community member for two years. So mostly in my free time. I also want to mention, my, like my email says, Modern Tech. Modern Tech is the company behind the Mandela project. I just want to mention we are highly involved. So, why do we need uh, software updates uh, in the Linux devices? There's three main point main points. Uh, there will be bugs in your code, so when you deploy your device in the field. You can discover uh, yeah, errors that you need to fix, and you need to do it somehow securely and robustly without breaking your device. You want to add features, so you want to get to market fast, uh, meaning you can uh, delay some features, get your product to market, and update later uh, new features. But also, one of the main main concerns about doing software updates is security. Uh, Every day, uh, security vulnerabilities are exposed in uh, the components you have on your embedded Linux device. Uh, and to close these uh, vulnerabilities, you have to update continuously. Uh, otherwise, it will be pretty easy to exploit your device or get access to your device. But the embedded environment is somewhat special. I mean, uh, We've been running Linux on servers and uh, laptops for a long time. And uh, for that specific use case, you have these standard desktop uh, package managers, apt-get, uh, rpm. Uh, and, uh, but th those have been shown that they were not designed for the embedded uh, Linux use case. Um, and uh, usually you get, yeah, you run into problems. So but the, the embedded environment is uh, unique in that usually you have distributed devices. So if you have a fleet of 10,000 of devices installed in VR, it's very hard to reach them and fix something. Uh, if there's a bug or something, uh, you would have to travel around and fix it uh, and so on. Usually you have a very long uh, life expectancy uh, in embedded Linux, especially like in automotive, but also in other industries. Uh, so it is like minimum five to 10 years you have to maintain these devices. Just not, you don't just sell them, you have to also maintain it for at least uh, one year. Uh, I'm 
one of the other common thing is unreliable power. Uh, meaning you can get several power losses in certain situations. And you also have unreliable network. In some cases you have 3G or 2G and if it's a moving device, it depends on where you are or where your connection is and so on. So all this adds to if you want to deploy software to a device, that's complexity and corner cases. So some requirements to be able to do uh, for like on any given update solution is to you want to be able to update all your components that you have in your device. So it's both the application but also the low level, like the Linux kernel, because that also has an exploit that you need to attach to the platform. Usually it's unsafe to update the bootloader if you don't have any built-in hardware redundancy. Another requirement is uh, the, a software update should never uh, render a device unusable, a break. So if something goes wrong during the update, it should not render the device unusable. It should somehow fall back to the last working state. This is important. Otherwise, you're, every time you're doing an update, you're risking your device, the functionality of the device. And also, atomic updates, and this is the problem you have with AppGet and uh, these kind of tools that you when you do an update, update, upgrade, uh, you install a bunch, of, a list of uh, packages. So if you get a power loss in the middle of these list of packages, you have installed half the half of the packages. The other half is not installed. So you can you don't you don't have an atomic state where you say okay, update has been applied or will not apply. So you can get in states in, in between and change, which can bring out like strange behavior. In this want to be able to integrate to check your updates. So if you're deploying the updates over there, you want to make sure that yeah, this update is coming from my server and not from a third party. So that's really important. And this has to do with signing into it. Also integrity check checksums with the transfer of device from the server to the device. And not exactly the same. And you also want to have some kind of compatibility check, uh, meaning this, this update is for this device. If you have a 10 device, uh, you want to be able to say, okay, this update can only be installed on this device and not accidentally be installed on another device. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people are doing uh, this uh, homegrown updaters, as we call it. So people realize, okay, we need to do a software update, we have an embedded Linux device. You can do it yourself, right? The, the requirements are pretty well known what you need to do. But what we are trying to do is provide a free and open source tool, uh, meaning more collaboration so that you don't have to solve this problem like, with every new project. There is a tool that does this and can instead collaborate and improve on that this time. But it also saves time and uh, save time, saves time. And it's generally, it looks so easy, but the experience has shown it's, it's not easy. <laughs> we, even we had that uh, assumption. Uh, so this is a, like a generic embedded uh, updater workflow, so not just manuscript. This is kind of the steps you need to go through when you do an update. Uh, and what we have seen, and I've, I've also done this as well, like a homegrown updater focuses on installing. You don't care much about the rest of the uh, the checks you have to do. So the co the complex complexity grows uh, if you want uh, to be able have to handle all the corner cases. But some some examples where probably some kind of homegrown updater uh, <laughs> where it's gone bad. Uh, but this, this was like a on the news for a while back, uh, a lot. This, this, this Airbnb lot, where they deployed a software update and break uh, with the devices, basically. So they still work with the key, but the, this is a common key lock used in, on uh, Airbnb, where you can, uh, where uh, Airbnb host can unlock the door with an app. So 
a lot of Bagley customers, and the problem in this case was, yeah, they deployed the software that was targeting one device to another. But also like larger companies, they're probably like do sourcing over there update from some other large company. Uh, but it's hard for them as well. And th this was also all over the news. Uh, Lexus did a over there update on uh, their people here. Which resulted in the infotainment and navigation. Uh, the navigation unit uh, ended up in a booth uh, and was unusable. They had to drive it. So I mean, it shows that it's not easy to get right. Even like big corner paper companies, also. Uh, and there are these kind of cases popping up uh, where yeah, things go bad. Uh, there's also the, these examples of like botnets. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept. There was a botnet called Miraya, uh, which basically took out uh, the West Coast in the US by doing a denial of service attack using uh, two or three hundred infected embedded devices. In this case, they focused on this uh, IP camera that you could buy on eBay. But this had a known exploit, or it had a, like a default password. So they could get root access to these devices, and when they did this, created a botnet that yeah, each device that they, they infect, in turn, tries to find another device this network of bots and uh, basically took out the internet on the West Coast in the US. Taking down sites like GitHub, Amazon, and then Reddit and so on. So this is what happens if you like in the security on large fleet of the world. So you build up these botnets that can do a lot of things. There's also this bricker bot, but this is more a uh, white hat <coughs> botnet. So it basically infects devices and breaks them so that no one else can infect them or use them or anything else. And it's hard. The author claims so of Brickabot that it's done this on 10 million devices, but it's uh, hard to confirm that number. But it's still, they are fairly easy to do this. It's shown that you build up. And even for this one, the, the source code. I like this one, the Ricker box, but I think it's really, yeah, it's safer. Uh, so yeah, so that, that takes us to Mender. Uh, so Mender is a end-to-end -end open source software update solution for connected devices, and specifically embedded Linux devices. And end-to-end -end means that both the software that you run on your device, but also the backend and the management content is open source. And it's all licensed under Apache 2.0. Uh, and it's all written in Golang. Uh, mm -hmm. A bit controversial to do Golang on embedded. It makes a lot of sense on uh, servers. But we do get the question now and then, why do you use Golang on embedded? Uh, but so far, we have to admit that and people are more accepting to it now than they were initially. So yeah, backend management, frontend, uh, client. Uh, we have a lot of tooling. We have a lot of uh, like uh, QA infrastructure. It's all open source, and I'm not going to show you. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so some kind of key features of uh, Mender. Uh, Mender focuses currently on atomic AB image updates. So that means I'll go through it a bit more later. But uh, currently, we only do full image, uh, like full operating system image updates. We don't uh, allow like file updates or specific application updates. So you, you do full you know, file system updates and only deploy a bit of memory. Uh, obviously the communication between client and server is uh, encrypted. Uh, we also stream all updates, so from server to storage medium uh, without like you know, intermediate storage in between. So it's uh, streamed and unpacked on the product. 
We also have tooling and the management front end for like deployment management. I'm going to show you that later. And we also, of course, have like give cryptographic uh, signing and verification of update. So you can sign an update saying this is from me. The device is on the set of updates that are signed by you. So just quickly go through this AB image update. <coughs> so remember, you have some kind of bootloader on your embedded Linux device. Vendor uh, vendor requires integration with, with the bootloader, so that means we support a number of bootloaders, which are U-boot and Grub, which are the most common in the embedded space. There are some requests on supporting things like Bearbox. So those are the bootloaders that we support. Uh, and AB image updates means that you keep two full copies of the operating system. Uh, an operating system means the root file system, uh, the, the Linux kernel and device tree, for example, uh, and then the client is part of the root file system. So you have you always have one that's active and one uh, part that, that is inactive. <coughs> so when you deploy an update, uh, you stream the update to the inactive uh, partition, uh, reboot the device, and you switch basically. <clears throat> and with this, you get inherently like a uh, rollback support. So if you switch to image B, you try to boot it, it fails for some reason, it's very easy to go back uh, to the previous one. It does have the, obviously, you have to have two copies, you have to have storage for it. But this is the like the pure robust way of doing it. And there are other, other and nowadays storage is fairly cheap. So it's usually not that big of a problem. And remember, it's quite a large project. It's you would think like uh, as I was mentioning earlier, how easy, right? Uh, so currently we have like forty four repositories in our organization on GitHub. And this is all, uh, yeah, we go through each component. So I just wanted to highlight that it's, it's a fairly large project now to do this uh, securely and robustly. So I just wanted to go through the server a bit. <coughs> just quickly, uh, it's hard to go through the details on all, on all the components because there's many. Uh, so this is a member server or the member backend which consists of uh, a number of uh, microservices. Uh, we also have like third-party components like MongoDB, uh, Redis, Minio. This is a, yeah, this is where you store your updates. Minio is something. It's a drop-in replacement for uh, Amazon S3. <coughs> you only have ports 43 and uh, 9000 open, and 43 is the standard HTTPS port. The server exposes basically everything it can do to RESTful APIs. So we do provide a management front end, uh, but if you want to do more, you can do it using the APIs. Even the front end is using the APIs. Yeah, it's all document, documented in the documentation of these uh, APIs. <coughs> so server, we have a, we have a, a couple of uh, variants to test this out or how to set it up easily. Uh, we have something called the demo environment, uh, which takes, I would say, 30 minutes maybe. Uh, to set it up, if you have Docker and Docker Compose installed, it takes so this is a way to yeah, spin up a server and test it basically. Uh, we, all, we, all, we provide pre-built images for virtual machines that we find that need the mobile app. You can basically download that to crash your device and you have a full environment set up. Very easy. But we are like, this is not a secure, this is not something needed for production. Because to make it suitable for the demo, we have to pay some short. We also 
also provide instructions like how you set up a more production environment. Um, where we are working on sort of like step by step what you should do to be able to generate keys and so on and set up domains and so on. So we do provide instructions how you do it uh, more, uh, more in a production pattern. So we have this repository called uh, integration. This is where all the setup scripts and configuration files for the server exit. Um, <coughs> and this is normally what you would clone and set up the server. So this is like to set up a demo environment, you need to run three instructions. And this assumes that you have Docker and Docker Compose installed. <coughs> but it's also I was supposed to do this before. Could you make the font size larger in your terminals? Yeah, in the terminal? Yeah, if we're supposed to see it, I mean. Yeah, I have another <laughs> terminal. Yeah, so what this does is basically we have a Docker Compose configuration file, and I ran something a script, a wrapper script called up. So what it essentially does is call Docker Compose up, um, and it spins up a couple of uh, Docker containers, that, uh, and it's all configured so they are all connected and so on. This is the <coughs> demo environment. Uh, so it's not now running on my laptop. So we're just gonna go. And this is what you would get also if you if you if you run these two three steps. So I wanted to see uh, what the de demo environment also does. It sets up a virtual machine uh, that could connect as a device to your server. So we, I don't have any hardware that needs to be updated. set up. So we actually, but the virtual machine can deploy updates to it. Then it can use it so that's what we are going to The first thing we see, we have a device system. Uh, we have a device pending. So I want to explain this. Just you can connect to your server. It's not authorized to do anything yet. Uh, and that's because we have this uh, authorization process. So I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. I just want to mention it. Uh, but it's a basically you need to establish trust. Uh, is this device a trusted device? And there is a, a flow for that. So we have, we have two methods for that. One is admit a request, and that is what we saw in the front end. I have a device, and I can go and click and accept. We also have a pre-auth uh, method. That means you can pre-author our devices, which you want to do when you have, if you have 1,000 devices, you want to go in and click 1,000 devices, or 10,000 devices. So we have methods to like pre-auth devices. You can say this identity with this public key. I want to also mention, mention the member client. So this is the software that you that you run uh, on your device. 
this is what communicates with the server. Uh, and it manages like when you do a do deploy an update, it manages the states. Uh, it also manages this bootstrapping uh, optimization. Uh, it sets up optimization requests to the server. And we also have two. You can run the client in two different mo uh, modes. Uh, managed mode means it's connected to a server, and uh, yeah, your device is managed by the server. You can also run it in a standalone mode. That means you can provide an update image locally from a USB stick. So you don't, you don't have to connect the server to do an update. You can do it locally. If you have some kind of web service or... So, and what we can see here is the device sends a public key, but also a device identity. In this case, by, by default, it's the MAC address. You can change this. You can change it to whatever. What's your identity in your specific device? So we can accept it. Let's try it. So now you see it's moved to the, like the active devices. It's going to take a few seconds for it to update. Yeah. So every device sends uh, a bit of like inventory data. This is also high. You can customize what it sends. The server doesn't really parse inventory data, it just presents it. Uh, but it's some basic information about the, your device. You kind of, but the important thing is that you see here what software is it running on. This one of the server cares about. You can also like uh, remove this device. I don't trust this device anymore. Uh, reject it or forget about it. So the next step would be, okay, if we need to do uh, an update, uh, we need update images. Right? So there's this tab of artifacts. Uh, we need to upload artifacts. So I uploaded three artifacts. Potentially I have a bad artifact, so I'm gonna show you what happens when it fails. <laughs> they want to see, I want to show you that. So, Mender Artifacts, this is a new term for you. Um, well, essentially what it is, it's a wrapper around uh, a payload. Uh, and the payload can be anything. Uh, but in this case, it's an X4 image. Right? So this is going to stream an X4 image to your device because it's for image up. And it's obviously compressed, it checks some, and you can see this particular one is not signed. But, uh, so to create Mender Artifacts, uh, we have this tool called the Mender Artifact, which is a library, but also a client implementation. And this is a tool you normally run uh, on your PC, uh, or on your own machine, or when you when you create your images, uh, you also create an under artifact. Uh, so it's a standalone tool. You can create, modify, inspect. Uh, this is also the tool you use to sign the actual artifact. Uh, but you can also validate uh, does the format look correct on the specific artifact. And it's a version specification. So even though it's called an under artifact, it's fairly generic. It's a specification. Uh, or kind of metadata you wrap around a certain table. So it's not much member um, specific. It's just that uh, we, need, we needed to implement this to be able to manage these kinds of things. And so always compresses the table. And it's all documented uh, the specification, so on and so on. <coughs> so just showing a bit if you do. Uh, if you run the Mender Artifact to uh, read on an artifact, what kind of information do you get? Uh, this is similar to what you saw on the server side. You can see you set some kind of release tag uh, on the device. You see which 
device is this of the image compatible with it? Um, it can be a list of devices. We also see the payload, which in this case is X four image, you see the text on the size. We also have, a, right now I uploaded the artifacts via the management content. We also have tooling uh, around the server. We have something called a member CLI. Uh, currently this only supports logging into the server and uploading an artifact. And the intention with this tool is to use it if you have a continuous integration loop for some kind of built server. When you build your image, you can automatically upload it to the server. Especially like if you have a, you can upload it to the server, then deploy it to automatically deploy it to devices. But this is normally what we're doing testing. Like in production, we probably want to have more control of, of who uploads or who creates these. But we have plans to extend it. Currently, it only supports login and upload, but we have plans <coughs> to support more use cases that are common. Um, I mentioned pre authorization. So this tool could, could, for example, uh, take a list of devices that you want to pre-authorize and send it to the using the API to do so. So now we're going to do the fun part: yeah. create deployment. Um, so you have you have a deployment uh, tab um, where you see active. We currently don't have any active deployment. You can also have have a history. Uh, Past deployments that you can inspect later on. Don't have any yet. So we're going to create a battle. So this is a fairly simple view. You have your artifacts, uh, it shows you with device, uh, it's compatible with it. But here I also selected all devices, and what you cannot see here is if I had other device types. I've skipped that. It would say two or ten devices if you update it because only two devices are compatible with this image type. Because I only have one. So we're going to create a deployment. <coughs> It's kind of simple. You have, uh, if we had more devices, we would have a list of devices and what kind of progress uh, they have. You would also see, like, okay, out of 10 devices that I updated, uh, try to update eight, succeed, and two fail. So you get an overview of where they're from. You can also see the current trend. But I want to mention why, while this is running, and I didn't really mention the Groups. Um, you have all devices, but you can also create device groups. So if you have uh, testing devices or beta devices, you can create uh, now they have all devices. And then you can choose like deploy this update only to beta early adopters or uh, this kind of thing. Any questions? Is done ever? If you have like thousand, yeah, yeah, it's all done. And yeah, then you can do it from them. If if you don't want to have <coughs> thousand, but say you just okay, a hundred at a time, mm -hmm. group them. And, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, currently it's very. We realize that this approach is fairly static mm -hmm. because you have to manually create groups and uh, uh, you have ideas. You would have to do starting a method that you have more to make grouping more dynamic based on like attributes of the device. And also if you realize if you have a thousand devices, it's kind of hard to manage no. this way. Yeah, it's kind of automatic. Filters if you say so you can create filters for certain groups and so on. Uh, can you give some uh, real life uh, examples? We which kind of a Devices are, are handled by, by using 
mender with, with kind of device pools and some real cases is it meant for more to, to manage some hundreds of devices or even even thousands and thousands of it's, so it's type of devices you know already that uh, yeah we have, a, we have a quite large user base and it's hard to say what, what kind but it's so broad it's yeah, everything yeah. from uh, <laughs> we have uh, users and customers in, in automotive mm -hmm. telematics like uh, some kind of fleet management for devices okay. um, we have a lot of um, we have smart mirrors Anything that contains a Linux device. Yeah. So okay. So and definitely we scale. Um, it's definitely our goal to handle hundreds or thousands of devices. So. So it's not uh, kind of focusing to the certain no specific we're, 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 needs. We're, yeah, it's very if it's running in Linux. Can be whatever. Yeah. So really and scalable. Really and and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can also like uh, monitor. Now I see. Okay, it's rebooting with the downloader and new update. So it's rebooting, and uh, once it has rebooted, then it's see uh, that it's, it's okay, it's going to report to the server. Uh, so, what I wanted to show you is a bit the state uh, that the update goes through. Uh, so this is on, on, uh, on the client side, the device on, on your device. Client side. Uh, the state it goes through. So in it, idle, idle is just, uh, it's not doing anything. Uh, now and then it does a sync, which means it checks, it's, it's polling based, because we don't require any open ports on the client. It's a security measure. So the client will call the server on a certain uh, interval, do you have a new update? And this is what it does, like, continuously. And once it gets, okay, there is an update, I'm gonna stop download. That only means it takes the artifact from the server and puts it on the inactive partition. So, and, and this process is like the device is still usable while it's downloading because it doesn't affect the current running uh, system. So, once it has downloaded the artifact, it goes to artifact install. And this basically means just, okay, I've downloaded, set some flags, but there is an update in progress because. I got the reboot, and the last, the thing that marks an inactive partition to active is the member commit, the artifact commit. Uh, and this means there has to be some kind of sanity check, but it's, just, it's not just is it able to boot. By default, it's, it is, is the member client able to communicate with the server? Like once you have done the update, you want to make sure you want to deploy new updates as well. So this is the default check. Uh, and if you, if you can report status to the server, it's going to it's, it's gonna commit the update and make it active. And the, the interesting thing about this state, uh, state is that we provide uh, something called state scripts. So at each state, you can customize, customize the behavior. Right? So you can implement uh, specific like, sanity checks with this process running. Before you do the commit, you can also do a couple of use cases. Uh, if you have some kind of data migration you want to do between the updates, uh, you can do it between those, these two states. Uh, user confirmation. By default, the vendor client will download the update and reboot without asking anyone, right? In certain situations, you have a graphical con like interface to your device. You want to have some kind of user confirmation that it's okay to reboot now. So you can implement this <coughs> state script. Uh, and we have mentioned already custom <coughs> checks. Once the device boots, 
So uh, you said that the default uh, check before committing is to uh, check for connectivity. Uh, Not just connectivity to like ah, the, to the port to status of the server. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the, the common case that you mentioned before is that you are on a, in a moving device that maybe, maybe loses its connectivity. Would you roll back directly or would you wait until you get, I mean, the default behavior? Would that be to roll back directly if, if the connectivity is lost while updating, so to speak? Mm -hmm. In certain, it depends where where connectivity is lost. In, in that situation, it will do retries. Okay. So, but if it, if it's like connectivity is lost for thirty minutes, it's going to do a roll back. Um, but we also support like the download state uh, supports resuming uh, the download. So if you have a connectivity loss in the middle, it will, and then once you get it back, it will resume. <clears throat> is um, custom sanity checks, or, or this kind of like an acceptance test that you can run that you define what your software is supposed to yeah. do, do, like a minimum uh, feature? And yeah, well, what, what you consider, <coughs> I didn't update, is everything okay before I make sure, like, make this the active yeah. system? And if it is not, it rolls back. Right? Yeah, and it's basically bash scripts. We have a provide bash scripts that the, the memory client runs for you. Okay. That can check whether it's moving back. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the case, if you do the reboot and then it doesn't come up again, is there any, like, uh, do you have any ideas? Like, one might be that it fails, but how do you get back to the because I'm guessing it's the bootloader that yeah. selects the old system. Yeah, there, there's this feature in the, in the bootloader, it's called bootcamp n. Yeah. Uh, so you store how many times have I tried to boot. Yeah, but that, I mean, like, just because you try to boot does not mean that the system reboots when it fails. No, but that's something you have to... Yeah, that's, that's custom, device specific. Yeah. You have to have some kind of watchdog that the, if the kernel <coughs> doesn't boot, yeah. you have to have a hardware watchdog that resets it. In that case, like you can roll it back to the system or start it again. So, yeah, that specific one. You know. Yeah, it's not nothing that I expect software to solve. No, it, no. It actually, but it's. Yeah, it will, like, it will fail if, it, it, if it's not able to find the Linux kernel image, yeah. for example. Then the bootloader knows, okay, I didn't find it. But if you get like a kernel panic with uh, mm -hmm. this has happened, now I'm stopping. Yeah. Th then somebody has to go and yeah. pull the plug. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you well, can have an, the, it's an entire chain. You could have an entire chain that if you yeah. configure the kernel to automatically reboot in a panic, yeah. and you have that problem solved. Yeah. The next problem is that to start the init, then you can have uh, like the init hooks up uh, watchdog that yeah. application pings <laughs> the init yeah. and so on, and then you have an uh, entire chain up to your end user application on the device. Yeah. So, yeah, but you need to build it in mean, multiple layers. Because yeah. uh, I'm a hardware guy, uh, <laughs> I, I would probably <coughs> hope for a watchdog. Driver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nowadays it's fairly common to like yeah. embed it. Uh, I know that in most ARM embedded, there's actually a watchdog. That's the first thing that everybody does is disable it. Yeah, because like, you don't understand what it's yeah. for. So you need to find it in every. Yeah, but we, can, we cannot fix that. No. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we did this. I have another question. You okay. said that you had uh, one use case where the end user selects if you, if you want the update or not. But I guess uh, then you want to have the possibility to force. Uh, I mean, you can find, uh, you, you know, that you have a bug, a security issue, or a safety issue. Mm -hmm. Then you want to force them to take it. You can do that still, or? Yeah, because this is this. But we, the direct thing here is you like custom script. Yeah. So if you... You can decide, yeah, yeah. you can yeah. implement that. Also, I would mention like this, the state scripts are part of the update that you send to your device. Yeah. Okay. So it's not something that's on your device because they are part of your specific deployment. Mm -hmm. So if you want to force one, you remove that red one. Mm -hmm. But can you, can you update the user confirmation script? With the update, since the update is for the next root effort system, I guess I'm guessing. Yeah, the state scripts are part of the deployment. Yeah, because 
then the user confirmation comes before the deployment? No, it just comes with it. But it's uh, no, no. But be before the new software, which where you have removed the user confirmation, is not active when when this check is on the old software. I'm, I'm referring to the scenario where you're kind of trying to force if you have previously implemented some kind of user confirmation yeah, then you are trying to force without having the user confirmation but it's already on the <laughs> yeah, previous exactly. software yeah my mistake good really good question yeah some some state scripts are actually on the device that was that was my mistake every all the states that says artifact before them that's part of the like the deployment so download and sync scripts are on, on your, so you would need to deploy a new update that removes that script, mm -hmm. that specific state script, and then on. But even yeah. that yeah. requires <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But basically the ones that make the artifact, that, that code comes with the, up, the yeah. specific updates. So if you don't, so if you you don't down, look it before, uh, artifact install, then you can actually change the sequence of the update. Yeah, yeah. yeah if I you allow the, the download but the not place. installing, yeah. and, and the user confirmation is between download and install, then it works. Yeah, I, I noticed this, uh, this is in the wrong location. You would do this here, I would say, That's before the, the reboot. About yeah. the other system, the standard version? If you need, if it fails, then you need to do a root all that. Does that mean you have to have a copy of the old data? Yeah, you have to manage that yourself. So, you can, yeah. so, so memory doesn't need to keep like two images of data for us. No, no that's uh, yeah, it would have to implement that in the migration script. But you can have that open, say, trying to connect to the telephone. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Yeah, but that's like by default vendor will just install it. But you just go over some new thing, track the version and after the web will come back to the next version, next version, and all come back to the five versions after. You get contact. Say you can do last one. They asked me how long I did it, I think that's for me. They need to show us the bad. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so we, have, we have a, you get like a report, you can inspect these, uh, when it succeeds and it doesn't succeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Now it's wrong, not what nice. It's bad. It's bad. This is going to be a bit faster. So as we can see here, it's the bad one. It was fairly small, so it won't go to rebooting like immediately. It's just a zero table, but it's not actually. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a broken file. It's a broken install, or is it like, is it a well? Is it something that will be detected as this time will fail? This will detect be detected in your boot already. Because it's just zero data, yeah. it will look for the Linux kernel on the file system on five of them. The checksums are always there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not signed. 
Okay, I'm sorry. These are not quotes. How, how is it uh, with, the, with the data? If you have, let's say, situation, because you said that it's not ever that you are actually sending the data which should be in the device. It's actually the data migration have that there. What about if, if there's this kind of compatibility issue on data area? Data have different format, which then like kind of leads to problems with the new software. Yeah, that's, 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 that's an application issue, right? Your application yeah, needs it, to upgrade. It if it has a database which changes format, for example, yeah. then your application needs to detect which schema version you're using yeah, and yeah, upgrade yeah, yeah. it. Okay. Because the vendor can't know about your yeah, application. It can be a normal scenario when the data gets corrupted or, or something. Then it's basically the same thing. It's just that the application doesn't understand the data anymore. Yeah. Can't use it. Yeah, you're right. So if, if it fails, you can deploy a new version of the application with using Mender buttons. But then it would be nice if you have even the, the copy of the old data. Even when your application is up and you, you find a situation where, where the data and the new software version is not compatible. Yeah. You can actually try to roll back even the data. Apparently it's just in We are working on something called uh, this is the near future. Something called update modules, uh, which will be a framework to do more fine grained update. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna install a dev package, uh, then you can create a framework uh, to be able to do that. This is something that we are working on. But we want to we wanted to focus on the full image. Like a foundation, and from that, from there, we can go to more fine grain things. Because we'll always have these robust full image updates all the time. So these modules, do, do you mean uh, something like Delta download or something? It's not. It's it's, it's uh, You can create custom images, and custom images can be a file, a dev package, uh, oh, okay. anything. So it's more. So it's going to be a generic framework where you like you write your specific update module, what you want to do, and what files you want to store. So we're pretty excited about it. So it's failed. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what you can do, you get the full, like the, the vendor client, when it goes through all these states, uh, keeps a log of the current deployment. You can go in and inspect that, like, okay, why did it fail? Normally it's hard because you cannot log what happens in the boot folder. So it's, you don't really have that. You, can, you cannot have that uh, in this log. So it's not going to say much. Uh, it's just going to say that, oh, I rebooted and I'm in the wrong partition. And we should still have a working device. Was that okay? It's still like, it will die. It's working software and it's still like, it's working. So we didn't break. So I just wanted to. So this all break, right? But how do you get it from your device? <laughs> so, so far we've been using like an emulator. There, there are some requirements. Uh, we support like standard uh, storage mediums, like MC and SD, where you run like next to the process. We also support the more raw flash, like uh, UDI volume. So you need the vendor client on your device somehow. Uh, you need to have a, a specific partitioning. Uh, in some cases you have a boot partition, but it's not really required by them. But you need to have like the classes to name and be to be able to, to uh, and there has to be a, a data partition, which is where you store your persistent data. Uh, it has to be there because the member client uses it to store state. So, we do, we so, so 
to be able to control this boot process, switching AB, uh, we need to integrate the boot folder, obviously. So and we support view boot club. Uh, <coughs> we have a feature called view boot auto patching. So it will try to patch view boot automatically for you. So if, if it fails, you have to do it manually. Uh, for club, there is an x86. Don't have to Rob is all user space, scripts, boot scripts. Uh, so we don't have to modify Rob. We just need to provide the same boot scripts. So for that specific use case, you don't have to patch the boot folder. You just need to provide a custom boot script. So we, initially, we, the focus has been on uh, integrating with the Yocto. So if you are using Yocto today on your device, it's fairly easy to integrate by using MetaMember. Uh, and what MetaMember does, it patches uh, your boot. We could also generate the, the, the images that you need for your specific device. And normally, on a, like if you have an SD card uh, storage medium, the output is an SD image. And this is what you flash uh, initially on your device, the collision. And this has all the like, it's all the way down and everything. So you don't need transfer that to your storage medium on your device. But you also get the menu artifacts and this is what you upload to your server in the storage medium. So. so we also have this tool called Member Convert, which is in pre-release thing. So our initial focus was Yocto. Now we are like expanding that to other uh, platforms and uh, and Member Convert is a post-processing tool on focusing on binary distribution. Uh, so for example, Raspbian or Debian, if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and what it does, it, you just download your image from Raspberry Pi before, you run it through Member Convert, and it's like Member Image. That's the idea. Because um, it's hard to integrate in you know, all these uh, to tackle these, we have a lot of a lot of people are using that Raspberry to tackle and Raspberry Pi, and they want to use Member, but so far it's been hard. To use that. You can still manually integrate it, but it's a lot of work. So we're trying to more automate this process, converting these binary distributions. Into so yeah, I just wanted to talk about a bit. Uh, Testing is very important for us because we provide the, the thing that updates your device, right? So it has to work, <laughs> otherwise all this collapses because this is the component that, that has to work. Your application doesn't have to work, right? Uh, so we focus a lot on that. So we have all, all our like we have standalone unit tests on our on, on our components. We have code coverage reports, uh, and we try to keep it around seventy-five percent. We do acceptance tests and integration tests. So every like pull request uh, does an update. Like, tries to update and test all these, like in test rollback, test load management. Right? So every pull request goes through this. Uh, we have 14 different checks uh, on every pull request. And we utilize mostly virtual machines, like the new x86. But we also do uh, integration tests on Gigabyte. Devices because yeah, it's fairly easy to get them. So this is this is important for, for us, and this is all like all our QA infrastructure is open source as well. Uh, you can see what kind of tests we run. Uh, all our use Jenkins, all our setup scripts for Jenkins are also there. Uh, yeah. uh, and I want to mention quickly. Uh, I mean, this is an open source project, uh, and we, we are trying to, we are building, and we have a pretty active community now. Remember, there has been a team release. But we have a pretty, pretty heavy, pretty large user base. Uh, we also are starting to get like, contributors. Uh, this is how I got involved in this project. It was more, more developer, kind of strong. 
So a oh, very active mailing list, so probably, usually it's people like, oh, I'm trying to do some mind work, but uh, try to be helpful and generally it's very, very nice. <laughs> we also have an IRC channel on uh, Freenode, uh, it's fairly easy to get in touch with us. We can uh, take them questions. We also have something called the developer portal, it's kind of the, the entry point if you want to test it out or integrate it on your device, and you probably uh, get the updates. And we also have the, because like you, <coughs> devices require custom integrations, most of them. We try to integrate in a standard way, but it's hard because it's a very fragmented market. So then there's something called MetaNaga Community, which is a community repository of integrated boards. So these are member enabled uh, boards. We also have something called, uh, I want to show you this as well, uh, Member Hub, which is a complement to the MetaNaga Community. Uh, where we currently have uh, <coughs> boards. So this is this is basically a tutorial how to run member if you have one of these devices. It's fairly easy to sort of take. A lot of people have it so far. So it's very well documented. It's, you also see like test results, uh, which which Dr. Versha has been tested on and so on. Uh, but it's a couple of copy paste commands. To run a doctor build uh, and all to get uh, what you need to touch your device and do an update. And it's fairly similar structure on all these devices if you have a It's a similar structure, so it's going to be worth copy paste and do it. So this is all, this is community driven. But uh, the idea is that if you integrate it on a certain, on a certain board, it's to like share that uh, if someone else wants to try it. Get them out of the box and steal it. Any questions? That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> ask away. A ah, quick question. Yeah. Do you uh, cooperate anything with the non embedded uh, Linux updated stuff, project desktop or micro? Mm. Not much. You have seen uh, Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit, we try to solve this problem. Because they also do AB rebooting on the AD machine. They're focusing on this other. Yes, but it's still. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with them. Yeah. Um, in, in what typical cases uh, would it uh, is, we be better to use a framework that uh, is not uh, this kind of end-to-end uh, -end solution? Uh, for example, uh, REUC, uh, you mentioned uh, it was not. Uh, w w when, when would you use uh, that kind of solution and, and not a uh, member? Uh, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Well, if you are building something that will be custom. Yeah. I mean, member is end to end, meaning it's optimized for a certain use case, and for that, you will need some flexibility. If you are building something that will be very custom, only have a backend or backend team or because I mean the LAL and the SW update are flexible, to be more flexible and configure them in many other ways. And, uh, but they are more like if you want to create your own member, you can do it. Your own solution. 
because there are companies that are like with commercial solutions around these important things. Any other questions? Yeah, I will. Uh, if you can write your own backup for your update, couldn't you just uh, have a name of the name of the update, like source, and then you insert? Oh, this is about the forced report. Yeah, um, yeah I could probably. This is probably, probably Implement backdoor to your user confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> Special secret pin code and push that to the, the device and then, then it will, I will unlock the. That request before. But it is interesting because you want, in some cases, you do want to preserve major security. <laughs> or rather block this device from every other access if they do not press yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, disable network interface. <laughs> <laughs> Installed or disabled. Yeah, so your, your device is brick, but you chose it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so it's like it's <laughs> Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. Either you want to update or your device not broken. Isn't that enough? Yeah, yeah. that's standard. That's kind of forced. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like break your box. <laughs> Send a message that I know where you are living. <laughs> <laughs> Accept this update. Right from the user until the press. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.